I, uh, I've never thought about how to start this. <laughs> Should we say hi? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, wait. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can just say, like, you want to say, like, oh, yeah, we can just slide it the roll. <laughs> uh, Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another video. For this video, we're going to be walking through a web page that WashU has on their website, and it's going to help us understand the numbers behind the MDPHC application process like GPA and MCAT and the timing of applying as well. Yes, so we'll link this page below in the description, but the first thing that we wanted to talk about a little bit more was what it actually means to apply early and how this relates to the availability of interview slots. So um, as you can see here, taking note that this cycle will be a little bit pushed back relative to other cycles, so these dates aren't exactly accurate for this cycle. Um, in general, we see that um, people tend to submit their applications by, um, hopefully by October 1st, but in reality a lot earlier, around August 1st or by September 1st. And the reason for that tends to be that the unfilled slots for interviews are at their highest peak there. So even though there are definitely people who do submit later and get interviews, the earlier you submit, the more likely you are to be able to get an interview slot because those will be open slots. And you'll often see that for later in the season, people who get interviews often have to wait a bit. And often that's because those are due to canceled interviews or other things that happened and opened up those slots again. So really applying as early as you can gives you kind of the maximal benefit in terms of having available interview slots to think about. So moving forward, Kenneth can tell you a little bit more about the MCAT distribution at WashU at least. Yeah, so for the general takeaway from this graph to me is that if you're scoring 94 percentile and above, I think that's a generally a really comfortable spot to be. Um, the plus side of this, the opposite side of it, or the plus side of it is that if, even if you don't score in that range, there's still a possibility or a chance of you getting interviewed. So the, uh, the two main takeaways is you're, um, to be comfortable, you want to aim for 94 percentile and above. But with that being said, it's not going to be um, a hard knock against your application if your MCAT does not fall um, above that range. So in general, people I would imagine that don't have as strong as MCAT probably do have really strong research experience and probably might also have um, a high GPA that reflects a longer track of academic record um, and engagement with um, the material. Definitely. Also, one thing to note is that, of course, these numbers are um, somewhat specific to WashU. So definitely, if there's other programs you're looking into, you can also use things like the AMSAR, which we'll link below, that gives more information on median GPA and median MCAT. This is really, this data from WashU is nice because it's specifically for their MD PhD program, but it's still a good place to start um, for AMSAR for kind of making a school list. Yeah, the only thing about AMSAR is that that data is um, for the whole entirety of the med school, so it pulls in the MD applicants as well. Um, so just be mindful of that. Um, I think a gut feeling of mine says that if anything, the numbers for MD PhDs, um, depending on the school, can be slightly less competitive than the MD pool. I'm thinking especially of the T20s, that's the case. Um, I know at Penn, I think the numbers are actually lower in the MD PhD side than the MD side. And I think that on a few places, maybe Penn, but definitely on a few other websites I've seen, like they at least give the average GPA and the average MCAT for an accepted MD PhD applicant. So not as nice as this chart, but still something you can use to get an idea. I think that something kind of similar that goes along with that is looking at the GPA distribution. So as you can see here, um, sitting in around a 3.7 or higher tends to be a very comfortable place um, to be, but kind of just like we saw with the MCAT data, there tends to be people in each category besides um, it doesn't seem to be like there's much in the under 3.4 category um, of GPA. And I think this speaks to two things. Um, one, admissions is definitely holistic. So it's hard to give like a specific cutoff where someone will or won't get an interview. But at the same time, GPA especially represents kind of a, a larger trend of your academics. And it's definitely great and something that's even encouraged to see an upward trend on your application um, in terms of your GPA. But at the same time, um, if you do feel like your GPA is sitting below kind of what most programs seem to have is sort of like 
their minimal cutoff or like kind of what seems to be the minimal cutoff from data, you can consider programs like post backs or SMPs that are specifically designed to help you raise your GPA and maybe get it into a bucket that feels a little bit more comfortable for you when applying to MD or MD PhD programs. And obviously with MD PhD application, research experience is extraordinarily important. Um, so this graph is probably the least clear cut, um, or at least the conclusions that one could draw from this graph is probably the least well supported relative to other two graphs. So what it really shows is there's just a whole range of amount of time doing research. Obviously this isn't, um, the quantity of research you do um, obviously has no um, indication of the quality of the research experience you're getting. So that's an important thing to keep in mind when looking at this graph. But overall, um, I think the graph just simply says that, um, to me, that the quality of the research experience is so much more important than the amount of research time you have. So um, with that being said, it's just thinking about which ones what are your research experiences, qual a quality research experience, where you've been able to drive the project somewhat and you've been able to understand for yourself the process of what asking a good question means, how are you approaching answering that question, and when you collect the data in your attempt to answer that question, what does that mean um, to the original question you were testing? Um, so those skills um, can be reflected in publications, presentations, and that sort. But also I think that many programs are really looking for that in the letters of recommendations from the PI. And I think that's where they're able to best understand the quality of the research experience that you're having and the qual and the future potential of you as a researcher. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that that was really well said. I agree with everything um, on that point. I also think that um, kind of like one thing to take away from this graph, I know that actually I was looking at this recently um, preparing for this video. I was really surprised by just how many people applied who had over 6,000 research hours and me and Kenneth were trying to like work that out and figure out like what that would mean. And I think it speaks to the fact that for MD PhDs, a lot of people do take one or two gap years just to do research, um, which like makes it a lot easier to accumulate that really large number of hours that might be harder to do like as an undergrad um, while also balancing classes. So definitely um, that's something to really consider if you feel like maybe your research experiences haven't been as kind of like independent or hypothesis driven as Kenneth was describing as a successful research experience. Um, there's a lot of programs like prep programs or the NIH post pack that we are especially popular and we've been a lot of people on the interview trail who are doing them, but also a lot of people have really successful times working in a lab that they did their undergrad that they worked in and as an undergrad or just a lab at their undergrad institution like Kenneth. So that's also something to think about. Um, but also if you're watching this video and maybe thinking of applying without a gap year, which is where I was at, um, you'll notice that like the bar around 3,500 in terms of the number of people who are interviewed is about the same as the bar at around 6,000. And I think 3,500 is often where people who had a lot of research experience and as an undergrad specifically ended up. So like that's where I kind of ended up on that side of the spectrum. So like definitely you don't have to take a gap year to be competitive. Once again, it really just depends on like what you feel will give you the most kind of substantive research experience while also balancing wanting to like apply and get started when you feel like you're actually ready. So I think that that was a pretty good summary of some of the numbers behind the MD PhD application process. Um, I think that the biggest takeaways that we can kind of take from these documents is that um, there's definitely sort of ranges where you'll feel the most comfortable in terms of numbers. Um, and those are things that you should pay attention to. So you should try to pick programs where you feel like your MCAT and GPA are well aligned. You should try to always apply early regardless of the program. And you should try to get enough research hours that you feel that you have competitively demonstrated that you have the skills to be a good researcher, but also admissions are definitely holistic and there really isn't just some magic cutoff that will guarantee you an interview versus not guarantee you an interview. So as hard as it can be, especially before you're actually in the interview process and you're kind of just waiting and comparing, try not to focus too much just on your statistics because um, admission committees will see you as a whole person and the biggest thing is kind of representing a cohesive sense of self. Um, while being aware of the numbers. Absolutely. Um, and again, we're sampling N of one at WashU here. Um, we'll link to a couple of other schools where they do have some numbers, but obviously not extensively as WashU has numbers. 
um, so people can get a sense of different programs and um, the kind of ranges that um, the programs are looking at. 